Good evening, welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Murillo. I'm the State Section Director for MUFON LA. We have a very, very interesting program tonight. Don Schmidt, and he's going to be talking about the many voices from the grave at Roswell. Don's a best-selling investigative author. He was a former co-director of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. Uh, he's a, been a special investigator for doc, Dr. Hynek and director for, of special investigations for the board of directors at QFOS for over 10 years. He's a uh, Golden Globe nominated TV movie. He wrote the, the Golden Globe nominated TV uh, movie Roswell. It was based on his first book. He's led three archaeological digs at the crash site of Roswell. He's a founder and consultant to the International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell. Um, and he's uh, presently writing his ninth book on the history of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So, um, so if there's any expert out there, it's, it's this gentleman. And we're pleased to have him. This is his fourth time back to MUFON Los Angeles. He always gives a great presentation. And um, he just gives some dynamite information on Roswell. And uh, pay attention, because when you hear the naysayers and the critics out there, um, Don's got the information that just puts all that to bed. So with that, uh, I'd like to bring Don up and welcome him to MUFON Los Angeles. For those of you who uh, were kind enough to come this evening to Brave uh, as far as uh, my presentation, as opposed to watching all the TV coverage of tonight's debate, I suppose I could act out, you know, you know, a UFO proponent as opposed to a UFO skeptic and uh, at least give the flavor of what we're all missing this evening. But I figured I, I'm going to stall a little bit because I know the uh, debate was supposed to end at the top of the hour. So. Oh, seven thirty. Well, it takes a while to get here. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back. I've had so many wonderful experiences here in Los Angeles through the years. And as Steve was mentioning, especially dating back to early 90s when we were first working on the very first book on Roswell that we had written, uh, UFO Crash at Roswell. International bestseller. It would become then the impetus of the Roswell movie, which Steve had mentioned. And we had the good fortune of being on set, working as far as, as consultants, when we filmed all the exteriors in Bisbee, Arizona, all the interior film, uh, filming we did in North LA. But what was most flattering as well as inspirational was how the cast and crew treated the subject. Now we're talking about a movie, made for TV movie, produced by Showtime, which starred Carl McLaughlin, Martin Sheen, Dwight Yoakam, Xander Berkeley, Kim Greist, Charlie Martin Smith, Doug Worth, uh, Peter McNichol. I mean, we just had a wonderful cast from top to bottom. Our executive producer was Paul Davids, who I know has even spoken to the group here. And our director was Jeremy Kagan. So we were forewarned that, you know, as writers of the book, that we would be looked at, you know, as a bunch of groupies that on the set of the, the motion picture that we would, you know, be treated as though we were nothing more than just fans trying to observe all the activities in the production of the, of the movie. And I could not have been more pleasantly surprised at the moment we arrived. It was like, the writers are here. Let's get it right. And I don't care if it was Martin Sheen or, or especially Dwight Yoakam and Xander Berkeley. I mean, every opportunity they had, they wanted to talk about Roswell. They wanted to ask us questions about Roswell. And it didn't matter that 
we were still in the earlier stages of our investigation at that time. But nonetheless, they were so thrilled by the possibility that what if it was all true? What if indeed in 1947 something extraordinary did crash, that the government did take it into its possession and it's been covered up ever since? And how many have seen the movie? I can't see anybody. Just, I'm, I'm looking into the lights. And so, but I, I see that a lot of hands haven't gone up. Now, one of the challenges we had in even putting together the script was a finale. Because Roswell, as it still is an ongoing proactive investigation, very fluid. In other words, we have yet to still make a final determination. And yet, back in 1990, the fall of 93 when we filmed the movie, as I described, we were just getting started. And nonetheless, we still had to come to a climax, a finale in the picture. And it was something that, whether it's UFOs in general, but in this case, more specifically, Roswell. How do you put a cap to it? How do you draw the final curtain when it's something that still remains a mystery? So we decided that we were going to demonstrate the dilemma that all of us as UFO researchers face and principally how all the witnesses have to rely on us to convey and, and to demonstrate the information they have and the ultimate problem that they all face. So in the movie, we have a deep throat undercover individual portrayed by Martin Sheen. And Kyle McLaughlin is portraying the intelligence officer who was originally assigned to investigate the flying saucer crash back in 1947. And he's going to go public. He's thinking of finally going public. He's dying of emphysema at that time. And what else can they do to him? It's almost 50 years so he's just going to tell the world what happened. So the Martin Sheen character breaks him away, and they meet privately in a hangar. And he would go on describing everything. He tells him it's all true, the UFO phenomenon. We have captured actual flying saucers. We have bodies. There, is, there has been an actual... Uh, interaction as far as with the, the beings piloting the UFOs and they have worked as far as trying to even reconfigure our DNA and so on. So he goes on, thank you Steve, telling him all of this. So then the Martin Sheen character after essentially telling him it's all true The Kyle McLaughlin character finally asks, well, what did I see out in that desert back in 1947? And it's a classic example of the building up of a straw man and then tearing it down. Because then what the Martin Sheen character says, why, Jesse, the name of the character, that was just a weather balloon. He's just told him it was all true. But now, it's just a weather balloon. And he retorts, no, it wasn't. I held it right in my hands. And the agent says back to him, you go ahead. You tell the whole world, you have no proof. And that's what we all face, investigating the UFO phenomenon. We're still chasing that elusive, 
physical evidence, that proof that will, you know, demonstrate beyond a shadow of anyone's imagination that we're dealing with a genuine, true life phenomenon. The final scene of the movie is Jess Marcel with his wife and son actually out at the very crash site, just walking around looking for anything that might, even an old tire track, footprints, anything that would show that it really did happen. So you see how when you know your own reality, you know what you actually experienced firsthand, and yet you can't even prove it to your own family. You can't even prove it as far as to anyone who expresses any doubt. So you live a life of just constant questioning of your own faculties. And that's why it's so significant that in now over 20 years, we've interviewed over 600 people directly or indirectly involved with what happened back in Roswell in 1947. And down to a man, woman, and child. And hence the title, this was the number one selling UFO book in the world in 2007 and 2008. And unlike the previous accounts, this is where we allow the witnesses to finally describe and tell their own stories. Go on the record down to the deathbed testimony. Now, I'm sure all of you know that a deathbed testimony is admissible in a court of law. It's accepted as physical evidence. Now, the, the, the bunkers would suggest that, well, because it's about UFOs, because it's about Roswell, it can't be considered reliable. Okay. If we're going to throw out the deathbed testimony on Roswell, then how about we throw out the deathbed testimony on every other case that has ever been before a judge and jury, accepted as admissible testimony or information in a court of law? You can't have it both ways. If we accept Roswell or we discount Roswell, we have to treat all other such eyewitness testimony in a similar fashion. That is in our favor because the witnesses are again all describing the same event, the same details, the same information. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I want to just go over some information before we get into the actual storyline once again. And there's been a recent documentary that's aired on National Geographic. And you also have uh, the UFO chasers also on the National Geographic. When we filmed this documentary back in January, they demonstrate that they found an actual piece of physical evidence, a remnant out of the crash site. And they claim that they found a button, a metal button, suggesting that the military was out there back in 1947. Well, I want to state for the record that we never took them to the correct site for obvious reasons, because every time we've worked with them in the past, it's been a hatchet job. So we thought we'd, we'd show them who was still running the show. And that they would turn around and then claim that they found something. They found remnants. And they were not even at the correct site. So this is investigative journalism. So in other words, if they can't get it right on the site. They recreate and they shoot something afterwards. That's just one example. 
And I'm sure most of you in the California, the Los Angeles area, are no strangers to Annie Jacobson's book on Area 51. The fact that one lone reference, one appendix, on Roswell became the number one selling point for that book. And the suggestion that what had actually crashed in New Mexico in 1947 was nothing more than a German design Horton Brother flying wing recovered by the Russians at the fall of Berlin. And that the Dr. Death, Joseph Mengele, who was also captured by the Soviets, was forced to take 13 year old children, mutate them into appearing like alien beings. And this flying wing was then flown into New Mexico where it was crashed to convince us that we were being invaded from outer space. Yeah, I laughed too. Especially at all the journalists who took it seriously. Especially that a so-called journalist would even present this as being a legitimate explanation as to what actually transpired back in 1947. And once again, it was simply a case of anyone doing their homework the Soviets never did recover any flying wings. The only one that was recovered at all is presently at the Smithsonian in Washington. Joseph Mengele was never captured. He managed to escape down to South America where he lived out the balance of his life. And as, as far as 13-year-old children being, serving as the crew of any type of aircraft which crashed in New Mexico, I would simply ask which 13-year-old was flying? And yet this is what, again, the media latches onto. And I know it was especially prevalent here in Los Angeles. But it just demonstrated that once again, as we refer to them, we call them the theories of the month. Anybody can come up with any hypothetical explanation as to what happened. But it's never, it's never based on any eyewitness testimony. It's never based on any investigation. It's like, hmm, I wonder if this one will stick. Another prominent explanation is that we staged the entire event, the United States government, to make the Soviets believe we had had the recovery of a captured flying saucer. But again, it's never with any information, any evidence, any eyewitnesses. If anything, it continues to demonstrate that nobody believes the government, who is presently up to four official explanations. And as I probably have said at this very lectern in the past, any husband should try that some night coming home too late. <laughs> Honey, if this one doesn't work, let's try this one. I would think after the third one, we might be sleeping out in the garage, but the government can get away with it. They're, as I said, they're up to four. But again, what did the witnesses swear to? To their very deathbeds. Which explanation after all this time do the eyewitnesses still swear is the factual, true account of what happened. Now, it was just a little over a year ago, I was connecting a f as far as on a flight through Dallas, and I happened to run into General Wesley Clark, who was head of our Pacific operations during Desert Storm and was a former Democratic presidential candidate. You see him on the news programs all the time, offering military expertise. I saw him pacing back and forth, and no one else seemed to recognize him. And I thought, I'm not going to waste, I'm not going to lose this opportunity. But I did. I lost him. He got away from me. I don't know how he ducked into some side shop or something, but nonetheless, I went back to my gate thinking, I'll never have that chance again. And I thought, 
I'm going to walk a little bit beyond, and maybe he came full circle and got that far ahead of me. And sure enough, there he was sitting, briefcase next to him. And I approached him. And the moment I said my name, he responded, I'm not going to answer any questions on Roswell. <laughs> okay, General, I wasn't going to ask you any. But if you would give me a moment, I thought I would at least give you a little story. And maybe some of you have even heard this. How many know that Roswell is even mentioned in Ken Starr's report on the Monica Lewinsky affair? Never heard of it, right? And I, I went on to describe to him that when the grand jury subpoenaed that book that Monica Lewinsky had gifted President Clinton for Christmas, and when they retrieved it from his private study, they found it sandwiched between two books. One was a book on Winston Churchill, and the other was an autographed copy of UFO Crash at Roswell made out to the president. So yes, we are mentioned in Ken Starr's report. So I tell him that story, and he doesn't bat an eye. No comment whatsoever, and then he just, I have another call. Will you excuse me? And he turns to his briefcase. I thanked him for his time. And as I turned and started to leave, he said loud enough for me to hear, I'm sure if there were any answers, they would have told him while he was in the White House. If there were any answers. Now, we all should remember how this was one subject that President Clinton was very interested in. In fact, he himself sought out people who could provide him with information, striking out at every turn. But nonetheless, I'm always asked, do you believe the presidents are told all about this? Here was a shining example of someone as the president for two full terms actually went out of his way to get some answers pertaining to Roswell. And as he mentioned to that young boy in Dublin, Ireland, they tell me it was a weather balloon. I wish they would tell me. So is it any wonder we're not being told the truth? You can't even serve in the Oval Office. I guess that would be the ultimate definition of a cover-up, wouldn't it? I was contacted by Dr. David Hayar, who is the head of the Cornell Medical Department. He's the head dean. And he said, I want to tell you, because I worked with the late Carl Sagan. We all know Carl Sagan, or know of Carl Sagan. I worked with him for 30 years. I wanted to pass on to you one of the last conversations I had with him. Now, we all know that Sagan, for the last 25 years of his life, was very anti-UFO, was totally skeptical on the subject. In his early years, back in the late 60s, he was actually quite pro-UFO. Actually was very willing to accept the possibility that planet Earth was being visited but he was bought off once the government started to provide, you know, funding, grants, as far as uh, special projects and assignments, as far as through Cornell, like Nuclear Winter, for example. Sagan received a $3 million grant just for that theory, as far as to establish, you know, if there was any relevance to such a notion. But anyway, with Dr. Hayart, and we went to New York to meet with him personally. He wanted us to know that before Dr. Carl Sagan passed away, that he expressed to him his feelings that the most convincing UFO case of all was Roswell. Now that coming from 
who we would consider one of our arch enemies, or at least an arch debunker for all the times we dealt with him through the years. My former scientific director, Dr. Jalen Hynek, wherever we would be together working on a case, his behavior, his reaction, his commentary was always, well, what will Carl say? He was always concerned what Sagan would say if we were to go too far out on a limb on any one case. What will Carl say? Well, as Dr. Hayar told us, I guess we know now what Carl would say. We're going in the right direction. That he clearly, and as Dr. Hayar said, you can quote me, and I am, and I will, but that even Sagan was impressed with Roswell. I'm just going through a little up-to-date news, if you don't mind, because some of you are also aware that there's a movie in development entitled Magic Men, uh, which is about the Roswell investigation. And uh, Bryce Zabel and Don Most are producing and directing. I know they've actually even met with Ron Howard as to uh, being involved with the project. So we're to the point right now beyond Roswell, now they're talking about an actual dramatization of the investigation. We are planning on a fourth archaeological dig. In other words, we're not leaving any stone unturned. And within the last year, there have been remnants, artifacts found, metal pieces. And they have been analyzed by two separate laboratories. And in both cases, on a radioisotope chart, specific elements jump off. They are not of any known manufacture, at least that we are aware of, here on planet Earth. We are now planning on a third final analysis and then going to conduct the next dig primarily at that very location, that very site where these pieces have been found, separated by hundreds of feet. As one geologist described to us, it clearly demonstrates that it was something that ex was a mid-air explosion and rained material down to the surface. So. Again, I hope I, I, I'm demonstrating the proactiveness. It's not sitting at a computer and wondering and thinking a lot of what ifs or what could have, what should have, what, what I would have said, what I would have done, which is typically what the skeptics do. They're the masters of playing Monday morning quarterback. And unfortunately, I have neither the time or the inclination. So with that, I'm going to give just a cursory background. We generally all know what happened at Braswell back in 1947 when the rancher Mac Brazel out in the high desert of Lincoln County discovers a huge debris field, materials that he had never seen before, materials that defied any conventional explanation. So unusual that he not only would take it to his nearest neighbors, he would take it into town an hour and a half away. He would even show it to a state police officer by the name of Robert Scroggins. Nobody could identify this material. It was that unusual. Generally, it was scattered through this very area. You see off to your right, they're called the Twin Peaks. That's the Southern Capitan Mountains. You see that it's just high desert. It's used strictly for grazing cattle and sheep. But what's significant about it is in seeing that it's high desert. For having flown over the site in small aircraft and helicopters through the years, one thing is, becomes quite evident. That once you are airborne, you can see for 50 miles there's nothing to obstruct your view. 
So for those who always suggest that, well, could this have been anything top secret, anything that we were experimenting with? Could it have been a mogul balloon? Could it have been anything else that we had devised that we had, were testing or launching at that time? Well, the problem remains for such, again, proponents. The military would have found such a device even before any civilians did. Again, any aerial, aerial reconnaissance, any aerial search, they would have been there within hours. This material was out there for three full days before it was even reported. And then even after it was reported, down in Roswell and other ranchers such as Clint Saltemeyer and Floyd Proctor and Dan Richards, all made their way out to the site. And then when it was finally reported, Juanita Saltemeyer, who all picked up souvenirs, gathered up pieces of the material, hid them out in sheds, even inside uh, canned peaches and, and uh, in feed sacks and water towers, because they knew they had something extraordinary. They had something beyond the pale, something that no one could identify. And again, I emphasize this material was out there for days. It's finally reported in Roswell to Sheriff George Wilcox, the Chavez County Sheriff. They too couldn't identify it. He would dispatch two of his deputies. And a reporter by the name of Frank Joyce would call, hoping to get some late breaking news for his next report. And the sheriff said, I think there's someone here you should talk to. And Frank Joyce would listen as the man, the voice on the other end of the phone was quite agitated, was quite angry at first about all this wreckage and who was going to clean it up, who was responsible. And then it be, the voice became more and more somber to the point of sounding frightened as he started to talk about the smell. It was horrible. It was horrendous. You wouldn't believe it. And Joyce kept pressing. What are you talking about? Where was this located? And finally, the suggestion that it was another site which involved bodies, which Joyce would suggest, well, maybe it's something they launched over at White Sands Proving Grounds. Maybe they put a monkey up in one of those V-2 rockets they, you know, recovered from Germany. To which the voice fired back, they weren't any damn monkeys, they weren't human. And it's the first time that we have the actual suggestion that there was more than just wreckage, more than just debris, that there were actual bodies. Now, if Brazil was the only one, then I guess it's a case again, prove it. You have no proof, Mac Brazil. You didn't save a body. You didn't preserve, you know, as little junior here, an actual demonstration of what you describe. But nonetheless, for having talked to, as I mentioned, over 600 people involved, a good many of those describe the bodies, describe the little people, the little men. But as one of the officers described when he was asked, commented, they sure weren't from Texas. This is Colonel William Blanchard, the base commander of the Roswell Army Airfield. Roswell Army Airfield at that time was the headquarters of the 509th Bomb Squadron. They were the first atomic bomb wing in the world at that time. In fact, the Enola Gay, which had dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and the boxcar on Nagasaki were hangered at Roswell. This was a composite group that was put together in the final months of the war with the precise assignment 
of the deploying and actually dropping the first atomic bomb. They were the elite within the military at that time, the best officers, best pilots, crewmen, best doctors, nurses, all within the 509th, and they all happened to be stationed at Roswell in July of 1947. Now, keep in mind, this is the 4th of July weekend, and they get the phone call from the sheriff's office about all this unusual debris scattered out at this site about 75 miles northwest of Roswell. Now, also keep in mind that there is no report, there is no information whatsoever that the military is conducting a search for anything missing. Nothing has been reported missing. And this material is so unusual that the base commander on a 4th of July weekend immediately gets involved and he dispatches not a couple of enlisted men to go check out the situation, but he sends out his two head of intelligence, Major Jesse Marcel and Captain Sheridan Cabot of counterintelligence in case it was something foreign. So again, I, I, I want to keep demonstrating that everyone is behaving, everyone is reacting as if this is something truly extraordinary. Now, the two intelligence officers would follow Brazel out to the site. And many of you know from there on that it would precipitate the now famous press release that went out at noon mountain time on July 8, 1947, that the Roswell Army Airfield had actually captured a flying saucer. Banner headlines around the world. And yet within five hours, that explanation was retracted. It was substituted with this, the subsequent weather balloon, the radar reflector kite story. Story because that's all it was. There were no witnesses to that effect. It was where they did the old switcheroo, as even General Thomas DeBose, in a sworn affidavit, in a video deposition, stated to us that the weather balloon explanation was a hoax, that they were the ones who switched the real material for the weather balloon. Now, how many of you read that in, any, uh, in uh, the New York Times or Washington Post or the LA Times? Here was a Brigadier General admitting that the Roswell balloon explanation was a complete hoax. They were the ones who were responsible for it. And we couldn't get a single major newspaper to touch the story. I mean, just again, classic. For the willing accomplices in the media who are, you know, march in total compliance to whatever the government tells them, at least regarding this subject. Oh, they doubt the government on everything else. But when it comes to this subject, they have been so indoctrinated, so brainwashed, that as I was being interviewed by the science editor of CNN a number of years ago, it was Miles O'Brien, and we were in the very hangar at the old base at Roswell, where the wreckage and the bodies had actually transited through. And we were off camera, and he finally, he, he posed the question to me. He said, Don, you know, you've been working on this for a good part of your life. You spent all these years working on this one case. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, I have to ask, why are you doing this? And I looked him square in the eye and I said, because you won't. And he didn't like that. In fact, would not talk to me the rest of the day. Because I, I truly struck a nerve. Because it was quite accurate. They won't. 
I mean, they follow up on our research and they'll interview our witnesses. They'll, you know, they'll, you know, as I mentioned, National Geographic. They'll do a hatchet job on our work because it's always easy to just attack someone else's research and go through very little effort on your part. As the old saying, you know, Monday morning quarterbacks always win the game their way, but they never set foot on the field. And that's the problem with today's journalists. The art of investigative journalism truly has become a lost profession. So I, I mention that in just a warning that you heed anything you read from the press on UFOs, or on Roswell for that matter, because it more times than not is very jaded. It was without any, if, any research or homework on their part, to them it's all entertainment. It's all ratings. <laughs> See, I told you. There's, there's got to be a reporter in the room. It's, it's not coming from up here. They've landed, right. Should I be asking as people are first arriving how the debate went or? 50-50. This is a picture of the late Walter Hott. He was the first lieutenant, the public information officer. Walter was a dear friend. In fact, I was an honorary pallbearer at his funeral. He was the one who took the order to put out the press release acknowledging the recovery of the flying saucer. And, but Waller was a good soldier. His best friend happened to be the commanding officer at the base, Colonel William Blanchard. They had served together as far as Operation Crossroads down in the South Pacific where they became educated and experienced with the new super weapon. They were then assigned to Roswell together and everyone clearly predicted that Walter was going to follow Colonel Blanchard all the way to Washington and certainly make it the minimum Brigadier General. Well, he never did. In fact, he would resign from the military a year after Roswell. Yet he still remained very close with Colonel Blanchard, but he also remained very steadfast in his account of what happened at Roswell. I put out the press release. I did what the colonel, he would call him the old man, what the old man asked me to do, and that was it. But we always accepted that as close as he was to the very man in charge of the operation at Roswell. He had to know much more. He had to be privy to much more of the incident. So in all the trips I would make to New Mexico, which as of July was 111, 111 trips since February of 1989. And every time I go back, it's a little more lonely because there are fewer and fewer Walter Hots left. All the people who became second family to me, they're all gone. And yet I could always sit with Walter and we would talk and we would always kid one another. He'd be out in the front lobby as one of the actual founders of the museum. And people would be gathering to start the tour. And there'd be a cluster of people and I would say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, would you be interested in actually meeting one of the first ten witnesses who was involved back in 1947. And oh yes, absolutely. Well, here's his father. And, and Walter, you know, he was always, you know, good for a, a joke. And yet for as much as I tried, it was becoming difficult to get him to fess up, to open up. But little by little he did. One time we were sitting in his office and all, we were just socializing. And all at once I said, 
Walter, how tall did Butch, Colonel Blanchard, how tall did Butch tell you the bodies were? And from his chair, his arm shot out just above his shoulder. And he gave me a look that could have, you know, because I got him. And I got him over and over again after that. Down to, they were sending out troops to still search the area years after the incident, making sure they had every last piece. That they had set up a temporary morgue at the base hospital. That they had checked the material for radiation and it wasn't hot, as Walter would describe. That they had pieces that he brought back from the site and they had it on his desk of the memory material, the material that was paper thin and you could crease, fold, crumble up, but you couldn't cut, you couldn't burn. And every time you would place it down, it would just flow like water, it would smooth right out. And then eventually he would admit that Colonel Blanchard let him go over to the big hangar, P3, Building 84, where he saw not only the remains of the craft, the egg-shaped Volkswagen-sized pod capsule, but the bodies under a canvas tarp. And then that would become his sworn statement that he would sign two years before he died. He refused to go public because he had made a promise to Colonel Blanchard that as long as he were alive, he would never tell the truth as to what he experienced firsthand. And that after he died in 2005, it took another two years when his daughter, Julie, approached us and said, I'd like you to publish Padre, as she affectionately called her dad, Padre, Padre's statement in your next book. And Walter becomes the ultimate voice from the grave, albeit posthumously, because he was at headquarters. He was at the staff meeting when the two intelligence officers returned back from the ranch and reported the find, reported what was actually out there. And he confessed to the bodies that he himself had seen. Again, it demonstrates not only the level, the caliber, the professionalism, the expertise of the people involved, but that they above all else were true patriots, soldiers, that they were willing to keep this information to the very end, as many of them, as many of them have. Sheridan Cavett, who would retire a lieutenant colonel. We have him on tape telling us six different versions of what happened. From I wasn't there, I was there but nothing happened, something happened but I have no idea what happened, I was there, it happened but I can't tell you what happened, and what he told Colonel Richard Weaver at the Pentagon, I was there, it was a mogul balloon, there was nothing extraordinary about it, but I couldn't get anybody to believe me. When Cavett himself was dying, and his own family had tried for the better part of their lifetimes to get him to talk, his son Joe is a practicing attorney. And Joe came up with the very same idea that we use with Walter Hott. How about a sealed statement? How about something for posthumous release? Now here is an officer, plain clothes, predecessor to the CIA, Lieutenant Colonel retired, and yet even to his deathbed, all he would tell his son, I'm not ready. Well, he was never ready. He never did write out a full account of what had happened. 
Even his own boss, Colonel Doyle Reese, who was up at the Air Force Base up in Kirtland, New Mexico, wrote him a letter, which we have a copy of, which stated, when you finally have your press conference to tell the world, I want to be there. Tell the world what? It was just a balloon? Of course not. Because Doral Reese's own family finally heard the truth. His daughter contacted us that before he died, he confessed to having seen one of the bodies recovered at Roswell. Deathbed. As Colonel Cabot's own attending doctor described to us that in the last days he was sitting in a chair next to his bed and the family was all gathered reminiscing, storytelling, except for Cavett, except for Cav, as he was called. She said it was as though he, even at that time, was still afraid he might say something. The son Joe would describe it was like having a, a, a father who lived in a bubble all of his life. The government controlled him. Hence, such is the life of the people who were involved at Roswell. The intimidation, the harassment, the phone calls. Walter Hott, his wife Pete also described for 30 years, all hours of the night, three o'clock in the morning, one particular voice, Hout! Don't you ever think about talking about what happened back in 47. If you do, there'll be hell to pay. And this went on for 30 years that they were getting such calls. Is it any wonder that they never talked or that they left statements or ran out of time, never had a chance to finally even tell their loved ones what happened? Lewis Rickett, who was another counterintelligence non-commissioned officer under Cavett, after he had his heart attack, he finally opened up. He finally went on to describe that he handled the material, that he even had a piece and he tried to bend it over his knee. It was part of the, the rigid material that you couldn't bend yet it was paper thin, it was practically weightless in your hands. And that his boss Cabot was laughing at him, saying, making re remarks to the effect, even a sledgehammer can't scratch the stuff. And on the way back to the base, Rickard would say to him, neither one of us have been out here today, have we? No, you never were out here and neither was I. Again, control, a non-event. You hear it from pilots scrambled, chasing as far as unknowns. And they're told afterwards, it was a non-event. You will not write out any report. It didn't happen. It never happened. For 30 years, the people at Roswell were told it didn't happen. It was just a weather balloon. And then in 19... 78, Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer I described earlier, who I mentioned as portrayed by Carl McLaughlin in the Roswell movie, finally broke his oath of secrecy and testified to the world. As he put it, quote, being familiar with all materials, both foreign and domestic, this was nothing made on this earth. End quote. Only one publication ran the story. One. The National Enquirer. <laughs> Is it any wonder that the witnesses don't go to the press? Is it any wonder that the witnesses don't come to us? 90% of the time we conduct an interview we track down an individual, their first reaction is, how did you find me? Who told you about me? Who gave you my name? And how more times than not, they refuse to talk. They tell us 
as the late Edwin Easley, who was the Provost Marshal at Roswell. I'm still sworn to secrecy. I still can't talk about it. He said that in 1990, 43 years after the incident, and he was still saying, I'm still sworn to secrecy. Frankie Rowe, who was the daughter of one of the firemen involved, they were called out, they had the call that something had crashed north of Roswell. Her father was Dan Dwyer. Truck would go out to the site and then come back because they were escorted from the area by the military. But not before her father would not only see the craft, but also see the bodies. And one of the crewmen, according to her father, was walking. Later that afternoon, state police officer Robert Scroggins, who I mentioned at the beginning, brought in to the firehouse a piece of metal about the size of a handkerchief. And Frankie would describe how one by one they all got to hold it. And they all got to try to crumble and bend. And every time, as Frankie described, it was like quicksilver. It just smoothed right out as they put it back onto the floor of the firehouse. Later that evening, they would be paid a little visit. And there was an officer by the name of First Lieutenant Arthur Philbin. And two MPs. And Frankie and her sister watched as a shouting match ensued out in the front room. And then the officer came into the bedroom, baton in hand. If you ever say another word about what you saw or what your father told you, we will take you out into the desert and you will never see your parents again. And this was after her parents were told, we will kill your children. Now, obviously, that's very harsh treatment. You talk about in strict violation of our very Constitution, the idea that our own military was used in an action against its own populace, its own people. And then the very thought that they would be threatened over the recovery of something as off the shelf as a weather balloon. Now, is it just Frankie Rowe? No. We have dozens of such eyewitness testimony describing the military coming to their homes, sequestering them out in public and warning them, picking them up as they're walking down the sidewalk, telling them to get in the back seat as they would be taken out of town and read the riot act. The very rancher, Mac Brazo, who first reported the crash. This was after the balloon explanation came out. And he's detained by the military at the base for the next five days. He would not even be allowed due process. He wasn't allowed an opportunity to even call his own wife to explain where he was. He was subjected to a full army physical, including a full body cavity search. Again, do we believe they were looking for pieces of a weather balloon? And when he returned back home, he would describe, and he was so bitter that he felt as though he was in jail and how they kept him up 24 hours a day asking him the same questions over and over and over again. And then they swore him to secrecy. And they also threatened his family. I'm talking about the same incident. I'm talking about the very same occasion which involved all these people. The occurrence that in 1994 created the third official explanation, that being that it was part of a top secret balloon device called Project Mogul. 
And then in 1997, just before the 50th anniversary, the anthropomorphic wooden crash dummies, which wouldn't even originate till five years after the incident, which the Pentagon then came up with the new theory of time compression. You won't find it in any psychology book. It doesn't exist. It's strictly a military condition. That as we get older, we not only start confusing the years, but also the decades. We don't even remember what decade we got married after a certain while. Well, I guess that would apply to a lot of men, but... Oh, I'm joking, certainly, but... But again, a strictly fallacious malady on the part of all these men because I see a good number of people here tonight who I believe were present on November 22nd of 1963. And I'm not drawing any connection except this. For all of us who were alive on that day, for the rest of our lives, we will remember exactly where we were and what we were doing when we first got the announcement. And we weren't down in Dealey Plaza. We weren't there. The very thought that the very people who were involved at Roswell, who held it in their hands, should now forget any of the details and for that matter forget even what decade it happened, Sorry, it's an insult to all of us. All the young people who were alive on 9-11, the rest of their lives, were outside observers. These people were there. Now, did they, does the government ever interview these witnesses? No. Whether it was the Project Mogul investigation, whether it was the anthropomorphic crash dummy explanation, they never interview the witnesses. In fact, Major Marcel's son, the head intelligence officer, I mentioned that he retired a lieutenant colonel. His son, Jesse Marcel Jr., is a colonel, retired Air National Guard, and he's an ear, nose, and throat retired surgeon. He also held the material. His father, on his way back to the base from the ranch, would wake them, he and his mother, at 2 o'clock in the morning, take them to the kitchen where there was all this wreckage scattered. It's where he first observed the I-beams with the strange symbology that ran the lengths of each shaft. And after the Air Force came out with its Project Mogul report, and their principal investigator, the researcher, was a Captain... McAndrew, James McAndrew. He wasn't even an active officer. He was in the reserves. And Colonel Marcel would describe how after the report came out that Captain McAndrew would call him up and yell at him. What is it going to take to convince you that it wasn't a flying saucer? What's it going to take? Well, as Colonel Marcel first of all said, I outrank you, Sonny. Don't lecture me on what I should believe. And after the sixth phone call, McAndrew finally conceded, I guess we'll never know what you actually held in your hands back in 1947. It's quite a concession. The point is, the Air Force bowed. They realized that we can't interview these people because short of threats, they're not going to give in. They're not going to confess to this being anything but what they swear is the truth. Sergeant Earl Fulford was a member of the 603rd Air Transport Squadron. He would describe because we took him out to the very site in the very last months of his life. And he described how they were on hands and knees picking up the debris. They had gunny sacks over their, their shoulders. And they would grab this paper-thin metal-like material, crumble it, 
toss into the sack, and they could feel it unravel. They could feel it, oh, because he was constantly getting jabbed, poked in the back, as this material would unfold. And yet they were doing as they were ordered. They would take the material to a checkpoint, and it would be tagged and numbered and put in the crates and loaded into the back of a truck. I can even tell you who drove the trucks back and forth. His name is Frank Martinez. I can tell you who drove the flatbed with the craft on it. His last name is Hulk, good friend of the late Earl Fulford. I mean, down to the people who flew the bodies out, who were on those very flights. We just interviewed another crewman who was on the first body flight just a month ago. He's approaching 90 years old. And he describes the details that only someone who was there and in that particular aircraft would even remember. We talked about the rancher bringing the debris to the site of the sheriff's office in town. Sheriff Wilcox, two daughters on your left, the late Phyllis McGuire and her sister, Wilcox's daughter, Elizabeth Tulk. Now when the rancher brought the material in, one of the boxes of debris the sheriff kept in his office in a closet. Well, right after the balloon story, was starting to stick. The press was running with it. The daughters, the living quarters, were right upstairs above the courthouse. You look down a stairway, you could look right into the lobby, and then to, into their father's office. And there was a loud roar of vehicles surrounding the courthouse. I mind you, again, this is a, a, right after the balloon explanation. And the daughters observe as MPs come in through every entrance of the courthouse. And they race into their father's very office. This is the sheriff. And with rifles drawn, they grab him, turn his arm up behind his back, push him face first against the wall, demanding to know where the rest of the debris was. It's when you listen to these people and they become very emotional and the tears start to stream as they describe just how humbling and sobering the thought when two young teenage girls watch their father who has reached the pinnacle as far as law enforcement within an entire county and he is treated like he is the criminal. He would not run for re-election. As daughter Phyllis described to us, the incident destroyed him. What would it take? I mean, we hear of things that happen, that doctors or even clergy people have an experience that is so devastating to their very psyche that they're never the same as a result. That's the level that this was. And again, I'm just asking you to consider, is there anything about a weather balloon that would again force people to behave in the manners that I'm describing? I'm going to skip. Skip, skip, skip. These are some documents. I'm pictured here with the late Bill Brazel. He was the son of Mac Brazel. He would find pieces of the crash months after the military cleanup, especially after heavy rains. And he made the mistake one night when he was asked about finding any pieces himself. And he remarked, well, I've, I've found a few scraps, as he put it. And sh who should be at his home the very next morning? But a captain by the name of Emerson Armstrong, who we've also verified. I can tell you exactly where he came from. 
He was assigned out of Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. And he had three non-commissioned officers with him. And as they were standing at the door, they basically, Captain Armstrong said to him, Mr. Brazel, we know what you have and you will give it to us. Now what was not initially reported or even testified to by Bill himself was when the military then escorted him out to the site wanting to know where he had found his own scraps. His daughter, Fawn, was back at the ranch house with her mother, Shirley. And a number of MPs came to the house. Without so much as knocking on the door, they proceeded to pull out drawers, empty out closets, tip over dressers, slid open bags of feed, tipped over a water tank, all looking for something. Again, something so extraordinary that the military would have taken such actions. Now, I point out this was two years after the incident. Two years later, and they are still making every effort to retrieve the physical evidence. That's a young shot of Bill and his wife Shirley. His sister, Bessie, who would become a star witness for the Air Force's Project Mogul Report because she was describing that she was out with her dad on one occasion and they just picked up pieces of a balloon, which she did. In fact, if you were to go out to the ranch house, there's an empty silo, an empty water tank that is just overflowing with weather balloons that they've recovered on the ranch in the past 60 some years. The ranch is 85,000 acres. They're constantly picking up weather balloons. But they're weather balloons. And before Bessie too would pass away, she would finally concede that the Air Force pretty much tricked her and took her testimony out of context that she was only talking about the one time that she was with her dad, was totally unrelated, wasn't even in the same time frame. And again, she was taken totally out of context in describing an altogether different event. So another star witness of the Air Force, we can disqualify. So we're down to zero. The Air Force is batting zero with witnesses. We have over 600. I talked about the big hangar, P3, Building 84. This was a B-29 hangar. This is where the bodies, the wreckage, all transited through back at that time. This is Mary Cavett, Sheridan Cavett's wife. She, too, has passed on. But Mary went on to describe to us that the Cavett's and the Marcells Always would they get together weekly to play bridge. Except after the incident on this, this one time, the women remained in the front room and the men were in the kitchen. The men were heating up a piece of the real flying saucer, trying to see if the stove would even have any effect on it, which according to Mary, it didn't. And that coming from the wife of the counterintelligence officer who first wasn't there, then I was there, but nothing happened, and so on. For her to then you know, even admit that, yeah, he was out there, and it really happened. It was, it was something that even on a stove, the men couldn't get the, the, the heat to have any effect. This was a witness to, again, the memory material describing how someone had it in a garage and placed it in a vice, metal vice on a workbench, and then was told to take a hammer 
and then would hit the piece and it would spring in one direction and then it would come back. He hit it in the opposite direction and no matter which way you hit it, it always sprang back. And that, again, with the full force of a hammer on this paper thin material. I've been talking about the craft and bodies. This is the second site, the impact site. It's about 30 miles to the east, southeast of the debris field where the remains of the craft and bodies were recovered. Just 40 miles north of Roswell. The debris field is about 65 miles to the northwest of Roswell. This is the late General Arthur Exxon. Exxon was with Foreign Technology Division at Wright Field in 1947. He was the first lieutenant at that time. He was taking special training as far as with T2, which was engineering. And he described to us that they were told to prep the labs that the boys in the lab were getting ready for the materials to actually come in. And that when it first arrived from Roswell, that they thought it had to be Soviet, that no one could identify the materials. And Exxon went on to describe that it was a unanimous consensus that after they did all the stress tests, after they did all the heat tests, after they did all the fracture tests on the material, that they all agreed the material had to be, quote, from space. It wasn't manufactured here. Exxon would go on to retire a Brigadier General. He was the base commander at Wright Pat in 1964. Here I am with uh, Brigadier General Thomas DeBose, who I described earlier, signing a sworn affidavit that the balloon material was substituted for the real material, that they were the ones who switched it, that the balloon, again, as he put it, was a complete hoax. Not the flying saucer, but the balloon was the hoax. I'm going to skip this. This is Richard Love Ridge, pictured on your right. He was a crash expert who worked with the Boeing Corporation. He had residence in both San Antonio, Texas and Roswell. He received the call to go investigate the reported crash of an aircraft north of Roswell. And at first he thought that was going to be the case. And from then on, all the years with his own children, he would always tell them, I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. And just before he would die, he would finally concede that what he thought was nothing more than the crash of a conventional aircraft was something much more was something truly extraordinary. And there were bodies. And they were little people. They weren't from here. And again, he reiterated that his children should not say anything because they, the government could still hurt them, that the government was still watching. This was just months before he pass away. This is General Harry Krause. He was a V-1 or B-2 spy plane pilot. He was with the CIA. In fact, he knew Gary Powers very well. In fact, he had trained Gary Powers. And he described to his wife that when he first was assigned to Langley, head, CIA headquarters in Virginia, the first thing that he looked for was the file on Roswell because he had been stationed at Roswell. He was a 509th pilot, B-29 pilot at Roswell in the summer of 1947. And he too would confirm to his wife before he passed away that Roswell was the recovery of an extraterrestrial spacecraft. This is Corporal Ed Harrison. He was part of a Native American MP unit at Roswell. And their specific assignment was to guard a tent that had been temporarily erected with a chain wire fence 
on the south end of the tarmac, south of the base, the very night after the bodies were brought in. And the next morning when they would go back to relieve the other men who had posted guard throughout the night, the tent was gone, the fence was gone, and all that was left were the tire tracks of a B-29 that had taxied in. Can even tell you the name of the B-29, who the pilot was. Robert Ewing was the pilot. It was B-29, straight flush, taxied over bomb pit number one. Can tell you the names of the crewmen on the flight. We interviewed four of them. We found three others who refused to talk. And down to a man who have been willing to state on the record the circumstances surrounding that special flight of that wooden crate that was loaded from the bomb pit where they normally would have an actual atomic bomb. The guards accompanying the crate and the bombardier by the name of First Lieutenant Felix Martucci recognizing a mortician he had gone to school with waiting on the tarmac and remarking as they returned back to Roswell, boys, we just made history. And they realized they had flown the bodies out of Roswell. And most of you are certainly aware of Dr. MIT graduate, Apollo astronaut, Edgar Mitchell. How many are aware that he went to high school in Roswell in 1947? And how many are aware that he knew a lot of the officers who were at Roswell in 47? And how many of them confided to him months and years after the incident? All the way to Washington, where he still worked with officers at the Pentagon, all telling him it wasn't a weather balloon, that it was a genuine flying saucer. I can assure you if we would go through the litany of first-hand witnesses alone, we're talking of over 100. 100 witnesses, first-hand, who would tell you what Edgar Mitchell only was told, but by those first-hand witnesses. The idea that so many of these men are either lying, making up some story for whatever ends, whatever objectives they had back in 1947, or that they're merely reporting what they saw, what they observed, and how they, in protecting their families, protecting their loved ones, honored their sacred oaths, they remained good soldiers how many of them took it to their graves, how we continue the race with the mortician, the undertaker, as we make every last effort to track down every available witness as we still have time. One can only imagine the powers that be, just a few more years and the last one will be gone, cover up complete. Well, that's where we come in. That's where we still, not a day goes by that we're not trying to find this individual, this one who was in this squadron, this one who was part of this recovery operation, this one who was part of this crew, this person who was part of headquarters, and so on. And again, if they are willing to talk at all, they are describing the exact same account, the same scenario. And the pieces all plug in, the pieces of the puzzle all drop into the same event, one after one. That's the amazing thing about Roswell. They're only describing what they saw. They're not trying to fill in anything more than, well, I was the one who just drove the truck out to the site, went to a checkpoint, another driver got in, told me to wait here, and when it came back, they told me to drive it back into Roswell. I drove it through the front gate, and I drove it to a hangar. They stopped me, 
Another driver got in and he drove it into the hangar. That's all I remember. That's all I can tell you. But it was the strangest situation I ever experienced because it was all around that time when they were talking about the crash of the flying saucer. They don't talk about aliens. They don't talk about little green men. They keep talking about the little men, the little people. But clearly describing something non-human, something that didn't resemble anybody walking down the streets of uh, Rodeo Drive. And so we listen, and so we compile, and we put it all together. And the Air Force keeps responding to us. We understand they're now working on a fifth explanation, a fifth. Because with them, it's just running out the clock, stalling for time, as I mentioned. But not if we can help it. Not if we continue to build a case that we could take into any court of law with all the deathbed testimony, with the physical evidence that we continue to search out, the photographic evidence, the documentation, we're presently working on photographs that were taken in 1947 that clearly show something extraordinary. This is and has been an adventure of a lifetime. And I emphasize that I was a complete skeptic. But I also realize that if there's any chance, it's true. How does one walk away with the possibility of this being the biggest story of the millennium? And as long as there's any chance of that, our investigation continues. And one last point before we do some Q&A. I emphasize that our investigation remains very fluid, very proactive, and I'll state that I'm 99.9% .9 convinced. It's not a belief. I'm asked, do you believe? I say no. You become convinced as a result of your own research, your own investigation, the accumulation of your own data. You don't rely on someone else. There was something that Dr. Heineck drilled into us and when you can talk about your research, no one can take that away from you except personally attack you, personally attack your information, personally attack your witnesses. And that's without substance, because anybody can do that. But I would throw it right back at the naysayers. Because if I'm 100% convinced, which I'm not, I'm not here tonight, it's mission accomplished. I'm on with the rest of my life and no one's going to convince me otherwise because I'm 100% sure. Now, turning the tables, if the debunkers are 100% sure, why do they continue to engage us, to debate us, to challenge us? Why are they constantly looking over our shoulders playing Monday morning quarterback? If they've won the war, why are they continue to launch the attacks. It hardly would appear as though they are winning or have the winning hand. Because it's as though they are complicit in trying to also run out the clock. Divert us, distract us, always make sure that, you know, we're a little off balance as our work continues. So I ask you, please, whenever you hear or read the op opposing viewpoint, where are the notes, where are the footnotes, where's the source material, where's the attribution? Where's their own first-hand research? Or is it just a matter of sitting at your computer and just, I don't like what this person says because that's unfortunately what journalism has also become. We take sides. We didn't take sides. We were skeptics. Again, we went where the evidence took us. 
we went where the eyewitness testimony took us. And we will continue going in whichever direction. Hence the archaeological work, hence the sworn affidavits, hence all the deathbed testimony. You don't arrive at a final conclusion unless your information provides you with the material to make such a decision. Now, in closing, in summing this all up, I know so many of you might think, you know, we've heard everything about Roswell. There's nothing new. Well, we're working on another book, even after the Wright-Patterson book, and we have another one planned after that because we have that much more material. And again, it's still Roswell batting a thousand every alternative explanation batting zero. Most cases in a court of law are determined by circumstantial eyewitness testimony. Why again should Roswell be any different? If what, what the witnesses are describing is too much for us to handle, let's look at it this way. There are those who would suggest that, well, we just haven't matured enough. We've grown up in the space race. We've grown up with Star Wars, Star Trek. We know firsthand what it's like to go out in space. And yet we're the ones being told we can't handle the truth. It's too much for us. But think back to 1947. There wasn't even so much as a satellite. There was no space program of any sort. We were just in a jet propulsion, rocket propulsion was still in its infancy. And yet all those people who were involved back in 1947, they worked their jobs, they raised their families, they went to church, they lived out their lives. There was no mass panic, there was no mass suicide. And they were there. They saw it firsthand. And here we are, 65 years later and we've digressed, we've gone backwards. Again, only if we allow them to make such a decision for us. I for one, you know, I want the truth. I know we can handle the truth. They did back in 1947. It would be the ultimate tragedy after 65 years if we were to turn our backs on all of these voices crying off in the graves saying what crashed in July of 1947 in the high desert of New Mexico was not only something truly extraordinary, but again, as the one officer said, they sure weren't from Texas. Thank you. <laughs>